To God be the glory for your presence, for his power, for his glory. To God be the glory for him being in this space with us on today. It's going to be an incredible month. But it's also going to be a challenging month. Because I'm going to be the challenger. I'm going to challenge you to push you into the full breadth of God's promise for your life so that you can see what it is to be a part. Ask this question before I jump in. I'm getting right to the heart of the matter today. Ask this question. Are you a part? Come on, ask them, ask them, ask them. Are you a part? Or are you a part? All right, let me do it one more time. You can find somebody else. They were shady on that side. Find somebody else to talk to. Say, are you a part? Or are you a part? Yeah. We're going to find out before this series is over. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the time that you have given us. I thank you for opening up our eyes and our ears and our hearts to understand, to receive, and to put into practice I know that, God, you are the sovereign one. You make no mistakes. You sent us here. You set it up. You pushed us into this place in this space so that we could be exposed to your truth. Kill our ignorance with your truth and cause us to be resilient and even to be greater in every area and every capacity of our lives so that you, God, can get the glory out of everything that is seen, said, and done. I yield my members unto you, God, your servant. I have already become that I believe the confidence that you are going to use me mightily to speak truth, even to light in dead situations. And I know, God, that you have the capacity to give me an anointing that makes preaching easy and listening even easier. Now, God, be glorified by everything that we do here today. And we will, on the other side of it, give you glory, the honor, and the praise for all that you have done in us, with us, to us, for us, and through us. In the matchless, marvelous, and mighty name of Jesus, let the redeemed of the Lord shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Don't play with it. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. And amen. amen. On your way down, just give God the greatest praise that you have to give today. Hallelujah. So this series is going to be different. Uh, last week, Last month was an incredible, revelatory, power-packed, life-altering, mind-blowing experience, both for me and I hope for you too. It was amazing that we were able to declare war on the lies of the enemy. It was amazing to even figure out that we were fighting with the wrong tools, to fight with the wrong weaponry, and fighting the wrong person fighting a defeated foe. And so I want to carry us into this new series by giving us another opportunity to fight, but in a way and in a manner that I don't think many of us know or regard as significant as it really is. But we've got tools and weaponry that God has equipped and armed us with that we do not take advantage of. And I think we don't take advantage of it because of the other fight that we're having. And I'm going to open up your eyes and give you a greater understanding of that this month. If you're with me, just say, I'm with you, Pastor. That means you're praying. <laughs> okay, that doesn't mean just you're shouting with me. That doesn't mean you're clapping with me. That doesn't mean you're just saying amen. That means you're praying. How many of you will commit to praying this month for this series so that God would use me and the word, even if it's not from me, but he'll use the word to do the work in your life. Amen. And if you're committed to doing the work because his word works with your works, faith without is what? So he works with you. All right. He works for you, but he also works with you and that means that you have to be committed to doing the work so even before i jump in even before i go down this street even before i get further down the road i need to know that you are committed to doing the work so if you're committed to doing the work just thank god in advance for the better version of you and your life that is about to come so let me start by dealing with a part 
apart versus a part. They're the same five letters, but they are worlds from one another. Depending on one thing, there's only one difference between a part and a part, and it's simply space. If you move A away from the P, you have a part. But if it runs together, you have a part. And here's the dynamic shift here, in that that one space makes the difference as to whether or not the meaning is separated or enjoined or together. To be apart, A-P-A-R-T, with no space, is to be separated or divided. To be isolated, to be independent, to be aside from, to be away from. And God called us to be a part, not a part. Are you with me? To be a part simply means, or a part rather, means to be joined with. It is the equivalent of looking at your body and de de concluding or deducing that there is an organ which is a part of one body. It is to be a part of the body. It is to be included. It is to be, uh, it is also to even have duty. Because many times we'll use the phrase, uh, you, will you play your part? We want you to play your part. How can you play your part? We need you to play your part. Which means simply take responsibility or take ownership because you are included in the whole of what has taken place. So to be a part of him or a part of us or God called you to be a part of his service, his work, his kingdom, his church does not mean that you attend casually, does not mean that you worship sporadically, does not mean that you watch everybody else get it. Does not mean that you do not pick up your pen, your paper, your pad, your heart, your mind, your tools, your instruments, and you watch everybody else do it while you cheat off of their paper. But it means that you come to this space, to this place, to this reality, to this situational circumstance, and you come with the understanding that I am going to be a part of what God is doing in this season. One of the most frustrating things in the world is to know that you have worked for your praise. <laughs> you have earned your praise. You have sacrificed. You have cried. You have gone through valleys and you have climbed mountains and you have hurt and you have been wounded and discouraged and disgruntled. So the sacrifice of praise that you brought, the thanksgiving that you found in your heart to muster up and give to God is so earned that the person next to you is sitting there like a silent statue in the sanctuary refusing to give God the glory that you know he's due. That can be frustrating <laughs> because you know how good God has been. You know the doors that he has opened and you even understand that if it hadn't been for God on their side for his grace and his mercy they wouldn't be here right now. And so what God has called us to is not to be a part, but he says, no, I need you to be a part. When we roll up our sleeves and we serve humanity, when we go out and do outreach and evangelism, when we win souls to Jesus Christ, when we tell people the good news about Jesus who has died for our sins, we don't want to do it alone, but we need you to be a part. Push your name and say, I need you to be a part. Yeah, I need you to be not a part, but a part. I need you to play your part. Take ownership. Be a part of what God is doing. Okay. So last month, the sermon series was I Declare. Oh, y'all act like y'all love that one. You said it like you were ready to fight. <laughs> I'll try it one more time. I Declare. So one of the biggest warfares that you're going to encounter is the warfare for your time. Okay, so let me be clear. The greatest thing you possess is purpose. All right, you with me? The greatest thing that you possess is purpose. Here's why, because it's the only thing that the enemy cannot touch. He can't change. Purpose of a thing is created in the mind of the creator of the thing. 
So what it was created to do is determined by whomever created it. And that is its intended purpose. If it's used for any other reason, it is abused or misused. Because only the intended purpose of it can be determined or the term, the intended purpose of it rather can only be determined by the person who actually created it. So are you with me? So which means that if God created you, come closer, no child left behind, I got you. You look befuddled right now. So if God created you, you are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. You are made with the essence of God. You have access to the authority and the power of God. The proxy of his name even gives you the capacity to create with your own tongue. Power of life and death is in your mouth. If God gave you all of these things, he did it not for you just to do what you wanted to do. I know we in our colloquialism, we say, do you, baby. Just do you. No, don't do you. Make sure you're doing his will. Are you with me? And here it is. This is why. Because when you're operating in his will and you're honoring God's purpose for your life, you have access to the proxy of God's power. Obedience is the key to your power and authority over the enemy even as he attacks you in the things of this world and in this life. It is your ability to walk in obedience to God that gives you access to all of the promises that God has left and given to your heart and to your life at your disposal. So purpose is powerful because the enemy can't change it. Okay. Why does that make me shout so hard? Because if the enemy could change my purpose, he would have already stopped, blocked, prohibited, prevented, canceled, killed everything that I was trying to do, accomplish, achieve, be and places I am trying to go. It would be over for me because I know, and I know that some of you all are going to look at me sideways and crossways, but just ride with me for a minute. I know I have sinned. All you super saved bougie saints, oh my God, my pastor is a sinner. Newsflash, you too. <laughs> Not just me, you too. <laughs> I know that I have sinned and all, the Bible says all, not y'all, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so if the enemy had his way, your sin would have stopped you because you've fall, you fallen and you failed and you messed up and you lost it and you, and you went astray. One time the enemy would cancel you like the world tries to do now. He is the king of cancel culture. But the thing that I love about my purpose is it's so powerful that the enemy cannot change it. He cannot cancel it. He cannot stop it. He cannot block it. It will be what God has said it will be regardless of what the enemy has to say about it. So when I'm operating in my purpose, God created me for a specific purpose. Here's the thing. He also granted me, graced me, and gave me time to fulfill his purpose, which is now my purpose in the earth. If you're with me, just say amen. amen. Oh, okay, I'm like the, I'm like the guy. If, 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 you, if you get it, just blink twice. Blink twice. Blink twice. He gave me time. Time is the most precious commodity you have at your disposal. It's the only thing that when you spend, you cannot get any more of. Time is precious. Time is sensitive. Time is valuable. Not because time is money. No, it's valuable because time is what God has allotted you to fulfill his divine purpose for your life. So that's why you have to say there's 168 hours in a week. I have 168, no time to waste. I don't have time to belabor. I don't have time to avoid. I don't have time to procrastinate because I have no time to waste. So let me tell you how you have been. Well, no, no, before I tell you anything, let me just ask you. I don't want to be presumptuous here. How are you spending your time? 
So once upon a time, we actually used these things. It was a paper book, and it had a lot of different pages in it, and each one of the pages was numbered. Uh, and on the top corner, you would have the name and address on the second, and it was called a check. You have to actually talk like this to the younger generation. They don't know what a check is. What's a check? You mean cash app? Before cash app, there were paper slips that acted as money called checks. Okay? We, we didn't have direct deposit. You, were, you, were, you would show up and say, where's my? Or they late with my? Somebody better find my? <laughs> in the checking process they had what is called a ledger now if you were disciplined like Jason you pencil in every expenditure or expense but if you were undisciplined like pastor you go to the account and you have to look and see what the ledger is so when you're looking at the ledger, it tells you what you spent and on what you spent it. And it is amazing that when you go to your ledger, you can find out where you eat, what you like to eat. You got Chipotle on here 13 times in one week. I can tell whether you like your Starbucks or whether you like Caribou. I can go and find out where you shop I can see where you party. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> I can even tell where you took communion. I'm gonna drop it. I ain't gonna push it. I'm gonna leave it right there. <laughs> uh. But I, I challenge you to pull the ledger of your time out. Today, I, I challenge you to pull the ledger of your time out and ask yourself and look definitively and even look intrinsically or forensically and say, where am I spending my time? Because how much time are you wasting that does not allow you to operate in your purpose? Okay, come closer, lean in, here we go. Americans, this has been uh, by the uh, statistically drawn up, shown, proven. Uh, they've done surveys, and I found many different studies, and all of them conclude essentially the same thing. They're all in the same ballpark. This is from the Department of Labor. Uh, sleeping, on average, Americans spend 133 days and 14 hours sleeping per year. Working or doing work-related activities. We spend 122 days and 11 hours working or doing work-related activities. Relaxing and leisure. On average, we spend, as Americans, 66 days and two hours just relaxing and leisure. Household activities. We spend 36, a total of about 36 days per year doing household activities. Mind you, these are cumulative numbers. These are not necessarily 36 consecutive days or 122 consecutive days or 133 consecutive days, but amassing all of them or accumulating all of them together, these are the numbers that we come up with. Caring for the household children, we spend on average 29 days and 19 hours just caring for the kids. Socializing and communicating, 26 days and 15 hours. Now, this is the only one that I wanted to challenge. Because I felt like y'all talk more than that. Eating and drinking 18 days and 23 hours. Traveling and work, traveling to work 11 days and 16 hours. And I went through the study and I saw all these numbers and I looked at about 15 different studies and statistical data from 15 different places to see what was. And what was so amazing is that these are numerically in line with what every other study is communicating and articulating about the habits of Americans and or where we spend our time every year. But on not one of those studies did it say anything about spending time with God. 
And so it challenged me at the core to say, where are we as believers at making space for God amidst our busy schedules? We are busy. You are important. You is kind. <laughs> You'd have to see the movie to get it. Don't worry about it. It's like, what does he mean by that? <laughs> you, 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 we, we are so enthralled with our lives and our lifestyles and we've got so much going on and we're so busy but how much time are we really spending with God how much space are we giving him are we a part or are we a part and the difference very simply is the space that you make for God to be in your life Here's the thing, I'm a, I'm, I told you I'm going to push you this month, this is going to be real challenging, but you have a time for everything in your routine. You wake up at the same time every other day or every day or that specific day a week, you wake up at the same time, you, you have a routine, you brush your teeth, you bathe, preferably. You have this cup of coffee or this for breakfast or you stop at this Dunkin' Donuts or you go by McDonald's right here on this corner. You show up and you punch the clock. At this time, you take your break. At this time, you take your lunch. At this time, you have from this time to this time to get from your lunch and get back. If you don't leave five minutes earlier, you're going to be late getting back from lunch. So you know at this time, I've got to make sure that I'm making my way back to the office or back to the computer or back to the terminal or whatever it is you know that you pick up the kids at this time you call and check on this people this time you check your social media how many times per day you have a set routine for everything but my question is where is the space for God where is his unencumbered unhibited? Where is his time in your day? God called you to be a part, but you have lived and you have assimilated into a lifestyle where you are apart from him. Because you have time and space for everything but God. Let me give you the literal definition. I wore it for you today. My sister-in-law made this shirt for me so I could wear this and make sure that it was in your face. I'm going to be in your face. All month. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be ready to lollygag and waste time and you're going to hear pastor's voice. Make space. Make space. As a matter of fact, help me out. Tell your neighbor, make space. Okay, let me tell you what space is. The literal definition of space is a continuous area or expanse which is free, available, or unoccupied. You see it? As a matter of fact, read it with me. A continuous area which is which is one more time, which is Sounds like a song, doesn't it? Free, available, unoccupied. Uh, 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 free, uh, available, unoccupied. You're going to remember this this month. I want to know, have you made space for God? Are you free for God? Does he have free usage of your gifts, the skills? It's amazing how you have the audacity to be the unmitigated gall, to be stingy or selfish with the gift that he gave you. With the time that he afforded you. Using the resources of nature that he blessed you to reuse. Are you free for God? Are you available for him? Are you unoccupied to the things of God for him? Or are you too busy to make space for the one who has given you time? Uh, 
I knew this wasn't going to be a whole good amen type shout your mama sermon. I told Pastor Gaywood, this is going to be a quiet day. We've been exuberant for the last month and some change. They have shouted and danced and turned over chairs. We have had to pull out the sheets and people have been slain in the spirit. But conviction shall run through the house on today. So that you will check and challenge yourself to not be a part, but to be a part. Ephesians 6, 11 through 18. I want to talk about this because this is what I dealt with in last month's sermon series when we were declaring war. One of the ways that we wage war, I didn't give it to you and I didn't give it to you on purpose because I wanted to save it and reserve it for now. It's the transition piece for all of these other areas that we're going to deal with this month as to how and where and when you're supposed to make space for God. Ephesians 6, 11 through 18, I'm going to read it. I'm reading from the King James Version. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against spiritual principalities, wickedness and powers, and uh, wickedness in high places, rules of darkness of this world. In verse 13, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, that's today, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness for your heart's sake and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, take the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked and put on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the what? Word. I dealt with that in last month's sermon series. If you didn't get it, I promise you want to go get it. You want to see it, you want to go to YouTube, you want to watch it. I promise you, you want to see this series. So I dealt with this, but I stopped at verse 17 and I did not do verse 18 because verse 18 is so challenging, but it's also so amazing how many of us avoid, evade, we just abandon and disregard or even disrespect this last verse. Put on the whole armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the spirit, feet shot in the preparation of the gospel, the belt of truth, the helmet of salvation. Oh, I'm ready. I got my armor on. But here's the thing. The weapons of our warfare are not tangible. They're not earthly. They're not carnal, but they're spiritual. They're mighty for the pulling down of strongholds. So how do I tap in to the space or the place where, or the dimension where this fight is actually taking place? Here it is. Praying always. With all prayer and supplication or request in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication or request of, for all saints. The one thing I did not deal with when you are putting on your armor and preparing to do battle with the enemy is prayer. Here is why the enemy has been wearing you out. Because you have faith. You have the salvation. You are studying the gospel. You have own truth. You are honoring God's truth over what you see. You're listening to what he said. You have the word of God. You have the sword, the only offensive weapon that he gave you. You have the word of God. But the other part of that is you need space for prayer. You're not defeated, but you are losing this particular skirmish because you do not have a prayer life. So, and I think we missed it when we were kids. Our parents, some of us, are, we've experienced this. Our parents would teach us uh, uh, to pray over our food or pray at night. And it became so ritualistic that we lost the relationship. But I think we missed it because what they were not doing was trying to give us a routine. They were trying to give us a lifestyle. It was not a ritual. It was a lifestyle where prayer wasn't something you did. It's something you do. 
For many of us, prayer is something we did. But it's not something that we ongoing do. So we don't make space for prayer. The busier we become, the less our prayer life is. The more we have on our plate, the less we tend to pray. But you have a time for your coffee. You have a time, a set appointment for your hair every week. Oh, no, no, I don't miss my appointment for my hair. And my hairstylist is just like my gynecologist. Oh, I hear y'all talking. I just don't say nothing. I'm taking sermon notes the whole time. Hmm. Your beautician is one of the most important people in your life. Your nail tech. You will walk in and your nail tech is not there and you say, uh-uh, I'll come back. Because I've got a set person at a standing time that I want to deal with. Well, here's my question. When does God get time in prayer? When does that become your priority over the things? Listen, prayer is communication with God. It is you spending personal, intimate time with God. Watch this. And it is an exchange. It is not a monologue. It is a dialogue. You don't just upload, but it's in prayer that he begins to download. It's the activation area. It's where your ideas come to life. It's the incubator for your purpose. It literally really helps you to figure out you've listened to and heard every book, every seminar, every webinar trying to tell you how you get rich, how you become wealthy, how you get over it, how you heal, how you get beyond. They even went so far as to say, come here, I got to tell you the secret. It ain't no secret. He gave all the answers in his book. The truth has been written and he wrote it from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelations, from Alpha to Omega. He gave you the solution, but you got to spend time. Tell somebody, make space, make space. In prayer, prayer is the place of your connection. It's, it's the connection point between the super and the natural. It's, the, it's when the supernatural invades your natural. Prayers where earthly beings uh, put place a demand on a powerful God, the same God that, it, that created the expanse of the universe. It's where you now place a demand on him because his word can never return to him void, which means that what he says he has to perform. So when I'm praying his word, when I am speaking his word back to him, he has to do, he is obligated by the covenant contract of his own word. It cannot be rescinded it cannot change so when he says you are healed you've got to tell him God you said you were wounded for my transgressions bruised for my iniquity the chastisement of my peace is upon him and by your stripes you said I am healed I heard what the doctor said but you said in my prayer time I'm going to place a demand on God and God is obligated to say I sure said said it baby let me heal you let me confuse the doctors let me tell them that they don't win they're just practicing medicine let me show them that I know where every cell every tissue every organ every molecule every hair on your head I've numbered them let me show them that I am the one that controls your mitochondrial process I'm the one that knows your endocrine system I'm the one that knows where your pituitary gland is and knows how to regulate your thyroid I'm I'm the one that knows how to put your sails back together. I am the one that healeth thee. But prayer is the place where God gets to download his truth and remind you of his will, his word, his way, and his direction for your life. It's the place where our frailty of our humanity pulls on his great divinity. So when you avoid and do not make space for prayer, you literally set yourselves up to be consumed by the only weapon the enemy has against you, that's suggestion. 
And he starts suggesting, you're not going to be healed. It's not going to happen. It's not going to work. I had my own bout this week. I had to sit in my truck for about 30, 40 minutes and talk myself back down from what the doctor told me. I said, oh, no, 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 no. Mm -mm. Uh-uh, no, this ain't, this ain't your body, doc. This is the Lord's body. And I got too much work to do and too many things in front of me. I started speaking God's truth and reminding myself of his promise. And when I reminded myself of his promise, the enemy's voice got softer and softer and softer and softer until it was gone. Thank you, Holy Ghost. So let's talk about the power of prayer. Because surely... You must not know the power of prayer. Otherwise, you would have made more space. The power of prayer should not be underestimated. In James 5, 16 through 18, I'm going to throw a lot of scriptural references up because I can't tell you my opinion. I have to give you his truth. Okay, so when you come and you're expecting this month uh, to learn, to grow, and to glean, and to, and to grab, I need you to make sure that you are prepared to walk through the word. Because it's not about my opinion. It's, this is not seven points to effective life. Mm -mm, this ain't that. This is, this is what the Lord, thus saith the Lord about your life. Okay. James 5th chapter verses 16 through 18. If you got to throw it up there for me. There we go. Listen, read along with me. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and what? Pray. Say it again. And what? Pray. Say it one more time. And pray, pray for each other, not tweet, not Facebook, not Instagram. It says, do what for each other? Pray for each other so that you may be healed. Because the prayers of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Pray for each other. Pray for each other that you might be. You mean to tell me that my healing is locked up in, the, in, in, the, in somebody else's ability to help pray for me? It makes it powerful that the intercessors and the people around you need to also be prayer warriors. So I came home to my family this week and I gave them the bad news or the, you know, the discouraging news that the doctor gave me. I said, listen, I need all y'all at the same time because I ain't going to repeat this ever again. We're not talking about this no more. Because I, I don't want to get back in that headspace where the enemy starts speaking and suggesting to me what it is and what it ain't, what it will and what it won't be, what it can and what I can't. And so I said, let me tell all y'all at the same time. I got done. And, and, I, and, I, and I, of course, had to make sure they understood, like, listen, I ain't where I was when I walked out of there now. It took me about 30, 40 minutes. I sat there in the parking lot, just, just, just sitting there, and I, I finally started saying, okay, no, 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 uh -uh, no, no. You're suggesting that it's not going to be what it's not going to be. You're suggesting that I can't what I can. No, no, no. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. It is the Lord that gives me strength. It is the Lord that it is his, his joy. My, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. I had to start speaking over myself. But I came home and I shared it with my family what the doctor said. And so ultimately, uh, I got up and I was walking over there. My son, my baby boy, grabbed me and he was just holding on to me. And I'm thinking, watch this, I'm thinking he was emotional. Worried about dad. And he wouldn't let me go. So we're just standing there. And so I'm holding him. I'm just patting him. I said, all right, son, this, we good. We all right, we good. I said, hey, you good? He said, I'm praying for you. <laughs> you need some people in your circle. You need some people in your life who when the enemy starts suggesting things that you know are not of God that will grab you and won't let you go and say, no, you will be healed because I'm praying for you. I'm standing in the gap. I'm going to lift you up where the enemy is trying to tear you down. You need some people that will... I know... Sit down, sit down, sit down. We're just talking, we're just talking. I know the only reason you haven't made space for prayer is because you didn't understand the power that it has. So read on, Elijah, in verse 17. Verse 17. E Elijah was a human being. Every human being, lift your hand. I knew I had a few aliens, but... Let's try one more time. Every human being, lift your hand. Okay, so this means you qualify okay 
You qualify. Say, I qualify. Okay. Elijah was a human being even as you and I are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Let me get this straight. He prayed as a human being out of his own mouth, out of his heart, his thinking. He prayed and the rain stopped. Okay. Maybe you need to hear the next verse. In verse 18, again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. You mean to tell me that I have that much authority in God that anything I ask in his name, that when I pray and I believe that I have already received, that I shall have what I say. You mean to tell me that the same power that Elijah had access to is the same power I have access to? You mean to tell me that the same God that moved on his behalf is the same God that will move on my behalf? That's exactly what I'm trying to tell you. Elijah was a human you Elijah served Yahweh the only true God Jehovah you serve the one and only true God so what gives you the power to discount and disqualify the authority of God just because you are busy You've got to stop and remind yourself why you need to make space for God. I know the only reason you're not praying is because you don't know the power of it. So, so let me help you even further. The power, the power of prayer is about not whom is praying or you, the one that is praying. The power of prayer is about the God to whom you are praying. Okay, 1 John 5, 14 and 15. Let's go right quick. Come on, 1 John 5. Oh, bless your name, Jesus. 1 John 5. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. This, 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 this is the confidence that we have when we approach God. That if we ask anything according to his will, key word, according to his will, he what? He hears us, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we, whatever, 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 whatever we ask, we know that we have what we've already asked him for, because he is the God that has the capacity and capability, the potential and the power to move on our behalf and do what he promised he will do. Our prayers are not based on the, the eloquence of our speaking. I know it went viral. I didn't even intend for it to go viral. Didn't know it was going to go viral. I released it because I felt like the world needed prayer. But I can't tell you how many places I go where people say, Oh my God, Doc, you can pray. Father God, I come before you today. Head bowed and body bent. I, 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 I hear it 13,000 times a day. And people say, you can pray. God, you can pray. Oh my God, you can pray. And I want to say it every time, but I just bite my tongue and keep it to myself. And I want to turn it around and say, and you can too. As a matter of fact, you should. We feel like we can't pray because we don't pray like he prays or she prays or they prays or how they prayed or how... Some of them are solemn, some of them are quiet, some of them are exuberant, some of them are passionate, some of them are black. You have to be a part of the culture to understand that. Let me give you the breakdown. A a passionate, over the top, full of life, vigor and vitality. 
But the Bible says very simple in Matthew 6, 7 through 8. And when you pray, do not go on and on and on and on babbling like pagans. Do you understand that you cancel the effectiveness and efficacy of your own prayer when you keep pleading for God to do the same thing that you've asked him once? The Bible says when you asked him once, believe that you have received. You don't keep, your kids can't keep pestering you saying, and when we're going to go? And when we're going to leave? And when we're going to go? And when we're going to leave? If you ask me one more time. You got one more time. Don't ask me for that no more. Don't ask me now one more time. How do you think God feels when you keep saying, are you going to do it? Are you going to do it? Do this, Lord. Please do it. Are you going to do it? Please do it. Do it, Lord. Please. Are you going to do this? Please. You said you would. Now, are you going to do it? I, Lord, are you going to do it? He said, I told you I would. So the power is not in the one that is praying. It's in the person to whom we're praying, and that is God. Power of prayer has no limitations. In Genesis 18, 14, he asked the question. He says, is there anything too hard for God? And in Jeremiah 32, he turns around and answers and says, there is nothing too hard for God. So if you know the power of prayer, I know you're not praying because you don't think you can, but let me give you this. Prayer is not a gift. It's a discipline. You don't have the gift of prayer. I have, I have the gift of intercession. No. You got a decision and you got a discipline. Prayer is not a gift. Look it up. It is a discipline. And disciplines are decided. You have to simply make a decision. Are y'all with me? You have to make a decision. To pray. And so prayer, prayer not being a, a discipline, not a, being a discipline rather not a gift. You seeing the power of prayer. Why won't you make space for prayer? We have corporate prayer services. And only a hand few of you make it an intentionality. We have Life, breath, strength, health, activity every morning. But only a fraction of people make space to talk to God. We have time for everything and everybody. This is my challenge. Go look if you have an iPhone and you're saved. I don't know anything about that other world. Go look at your screen time. Ask one of your grandchildren, your nephews, nieces, or kids to pull up your screen time and see how much face time you have given to your screen and then tell me how does it compare to how much face time you have given to God. So we read a text when I started. I don't want to abandon the text. The text is our foundation. It's our springboard. It is the life's blood for what we came to accomplish. And in the text, you see, uh, as a matter of fact, let's go back. We didn't read it. Let's read it together. Matthew 26, 36 through 46. Matthew 26, 36 through 46. Matthew 26, 36 through 46. And this is from the New International Version. When you found it, say amen. Okay, I'll wait. Matthew 26. 36 through 46. I have it on the screen as well. Matthew 26, 36 through 46. You can read along with me. It says, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He went in the garden. In verse 37, he took Peter and he took two of the sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. So stay here and keep watch with me. Verse 39, going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed. Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed. My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not I, but as you will. 
Then he returned to the disciples and he found the victory walkers. Oh, I'm sorry, wrong version. Excuse me. He found the church of today. He found you. I don't have my reading glasses on. Sleeping. He said, couldn't you watch, keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. And so then verse 41, he says, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation of social media. My version is really messed up today. The spirit is willing, but I know your frailty of flesh is weak. In verse 42, he went on a second time and he prayed. And he what? And a what? Jesus prayed a second time. He didn't just pray once and said, I've done it for the month. He goes back again. My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. He was having a struggle because he knew that he was about to go through a test. He was about, not a test, he was about to go through uh, the tribulation or the, tri the trial that, that was his own crucifixion. And so in verse 43, when he came back, he again found you sleeping because your eyes were heavy. Lifetime was long last night. HGTV had a few other houses on it. I'm calling you out today. I already told you. I'm going to be in your face. In verse 44, so he left them and he went away once more and he prayed the... You mean to tell me that Jesus prayed three times in a row? I know that's foreign to some of us. He prayed third time. So he left them, went away, prayed the saying the same thing. He comes back to the disciples and he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, it's too late now. The one who was gonna betray me has already shown up. So I need you to understand the power of prayer, the discipline of prayer. But the, there's a couple of things that I want you to take away from what Jesus has exhibited and exemplified for us. Are y'all still with me? Okay. First thing I need you to understand is that Jesus had a set time for prayer. I'm going to give you some practical steps because these are tools that you need to put in practice for yourself. He had a set time for prayer. There is a principle called the 21-day principle, and it's been psychologically, psychologically and sociologically proven that... Uh, 21 days creates a habit that ultimately becomes your lifestyle. So you develop a habit if you do something consistently for 21 days. Jesus had a set time for prayer. In Mark 1, it says, very early in the morning, while it was dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went out to a solitary place and prayed. I used to wonder why my mom was up at 4 o'clock every morning. In the bathroom with her daily bread. Every morning, she was going to read her stormy old Martian books. Uh, is that her name? Okay. And her daily bread. And she was going to pray. I'm so glad she did. I'm so glad she did. Somebody prayed for me, had me on their mind, took the time and prayed for me. Y'all know the song? I'm so glad they, I'm so glad she prayed. Jesus got up early in the morning. Sometimes Jesus went an entire night in prayer, Luke 6 and 12. He would pray all night. He had set times for prayer. You have set times for everything else. You need a set time for prayer. That is an uninhibited, that is an undisturbed, that is a social media free time for prayer. 
The other thing I want you to note about the text or about the, the scriptural text is that Jesus had a set place. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. You're not going to lay in the bed where you've been laying sleep and be successful at praying. You're going to need a set. This is my prayer closet. This is my prayer place. This is my isolated sanctuary. There has to be a set place. You, you, you got a place for everything else. You got a place where you get your feet done. That's your moment. For some of you, that's your time. You sit there, you relax. You don't want to be bothered. You don't want no kids going with you. You don't want nobody calling you. This is my time. When does God get his? You got to also have a set plan. Jesus had a set plan for prayer. He gave it to you in the model prayer. Called, we call it the Lord's Prayer. But he had a set plan. The, the Lord's Prayer is comprised of, of some specific components. Praise, petition, provision, pardon, power, and then praise. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Praise, petition. P petition. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That is praise. He ends it and begins it with praise. In there he asks for pardon. He, he makes a request. Please forgive me as I forgive them. For thine is the kingdom, the power. He even ex uh, he gives the exemplary uh, 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 a sign that God is the power. He has the power to actually redeem, restore, heal, set free. Thine is the power over the enemy. So there is a set plan for prayer. You've got to make sure that you have a set plan or you won't pray. Find some script. If I'm praying for something, there are so many scriptural passages that go with what I'm praying for that I need to have those scriptures laid out. I need to have them beside my book or have them beside my, where if God starts speaking, I've got a pen and a pad or I've got a, 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 a digital device or something that I can start taking notes as God begins to download and impart into me. That's a plan. It's not just you deciding to go over here and you're just going to whisper something. No, I have a plan and I realize that I need to pray his truth, not my feelings. God is not motivated by your feelings. He's re he responds to himself and he responds to him, his truth which is responding to himself. So if you know that I am praying for increase, you need to find every scriptural reference you can about increase and then go and make sure that when you pray, you are speaking God's word to God and you are, in, you are putting your supplication, which there's a part for petition in the Lord's prayer, in the model prayer. So you are making your request known unto the Lord. But I'm not going to just give you my request. I want to give you your truth truth which gives me confidence that you're going to do what you said you're going to do and then my prayers will be answered are you with me you gotta have a plan you don't have a plan so that's why your prayer life is failing because you don't have a plan for prayer you don't have a place you don't have a time every time you start praying you get sleepy that, the, the, please know that's an attack that's warfare to prevent you because you don't get sleepy when you're watching your favorite show. You will make everybody else in the house be quiet when your show comes on. Hey, 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 I'm watching Power. Kids go in the other room. You will make sure that everything and everybody, if the game is on, hey, 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 what y'all doing in here? Go back out there. The dog can't even come in the house. Go on out there. I, I, need, you to, I need you to hear me. You got to have a plan. The last thing is, is, is you need a partner. One can chase a thousand, two can chase 10,000. You need somebody you can pray with. You know, it's not always required. It's not always necessary. But every now and then you need to pull somebody else in because you need some you need some real power in the room. You need some people that can agree with you in prayer because when they agree with you in prayer, you tap into another level of God's power. Are you with me? Two folk, uh, a, a threefold cord is not easily broken. And I'm not I'm not I'm not as 
best as I can be by myself. In Acts the 16th chapter verses 25 and 26. Acts 16, 25, 26. Acts 25, 16, 25 and 26. When you found it, say amen. Okay, I'll wait. Acts 16, 25 through 26. I'm going to read it to you. It's on screen. I'm going to read it to you aloud. It says, there's a King James Version. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And at midnight, both of them together prayed. So, they are prisoners locked in a jail cell. No capacity for escape. Sitting on death row ready to be executed. And here you have them sitting together. So the, the enemy's greatest mistake here is that he didn't separate them and put them in separate cells. If he had put them in separate cells, it might not have ended the same way. But he put them together. And they realized the power of having a prayer partner with them. They said, well, we're locked in chains don't have much recourse. The Bible says they sang praises unto God and they prayed and until there was an earthquake that loosed their chains and everybody connected to them got free. All the other prisoners' cell doors flung open. Their chains were broken because he forgot to separate them. Here's the thing. He forgot to separate you today. The fact that you are sitting here beside somebody gives you the ability, the opportunity to see God do something absolutely extraordinary in both of your lives. Paul wasn't just the only one that was blessed. Silas wasn't the only one that was blessed. They both were blessed and everybody around them were blessed too. He forgot to separate them and he forgot to separate you. Why is that so powerful? Well, because where two or three are gathered in my name, there shall I be in the midst of them. So you are sitting next to some intercessors. You are sitting next to some prayer warriors. You are sitting next to some people that will agree with you. And as they agree with you, you can expect an earthquake of change. That the enemy is defeated. That God is exalted. That he's about to lift and elevate your circumstance, your situation, your health. He's about to take you from glory to glory as he promised he would. And it's contingent upon who you are partnered with in prayer. So to start it off, just in case you sat by somebody who is not willing to pray with you. I'm going to be your partner today. Everybody stand all over the building. I'm going to be your partner. I'm your prayer partner today. Come on. If anything, as touching and agreeing, this is symbolic. It's not necessary that it is a literal touch. The scripture doesn't say that. But as touching and agreeing, just stretch your hands towards me as I stretch mine towards you. And we're going to come into agreement. I'm going to agree with you that God is going to heal your body, that your family is going to be exceptionally and abundantly blessed, that God is going to save your children and your children's children, that you're going to see increase and favor. I am agreeing with you that God is going 
going to continue to elevate and increase your thoughts your mind will be higher the wisdom of God will be at your disposal he's going to order your steps and tell you what is what is not he's going to help you to discern and know what doors you should go through and the ones you should evade and avoid but God is about to do a new thing in this latter season I am agreeing with you in prayer father God in the name of Jesus we first of all acknowledge you are the sovereign God you are the holy one you are the mighty warrior you are the king of kings and the Lord of lords you are the great I am that I am you are the provider protector and sustainer I thank you even now God that you have given us the capacity to come into your presence we are not worthy to even gather the crumbs beneath your table but you so you are merciful towards us and you're so merciful that you give us the capacity and the ability to approach the petition and petition the throne of God and so it is that we come to you now first of all acknowledging our wrong we ask God for forgiveness of our sins that you would wash us cleanse us and make us whole again and we even now God ask that you would favor us with everything that we need all of our individual needs Lord let them be manifested and met in a supernatural impartation of your favor your goodness and your grace I thank you even now God that there are some desires that are locked up in our heart you know the petitions of our hearts you know exactly what we are desiring you know what we've been praying for asking for you know what has plagued us in the midnight hour what has kept us awake all night long what has troubled us what has worried us what has stressed us out so God we commit it and commend it unto you we cast those cares upon you because we know that you're the God that not just has power and authority but you have compassion and you have mercy and we know that you care for us and so we thank you thank you for being the God who answers our prayers thank you for being the God who hears us thank you for being the God who removes and moves all obstacles all things that are hindrances thank you that our children and our children's children's children will be beneficiaries and benefactors of the grace and the favor that is going to fall from this generation on through our bloodline thank you now that every generational curse is going to be broken that the things and the habits and the tendencies and the attacks of our yesterdays and our yesteryears will not come subject to our tomorrows that we're going to see the goodness of God and everything that the devil meant for evil will be shifted turned around and it will work for our good and we know that all things work together for the good of them that love him and are called according to his purpose greater is he that is in us than anything that we're up against in this world no weapon formed against us shall ever be able to prosper we speak healing we call every tissue every organ every cell every molecule of our body into alignment and God we believe that by your stripes we are healed our latter days will be greater than our former days what's ahead of us will be better than what's behind us the suffering of this present time it's not even worthy to be compared to the glory that you shall reveal we are more than a conqueror because you love us and the first shall be last and the last shall be first you're going to flip the script and blow our minds and it's not going to take a long time but suddenly immediately and straightway we believe you for an extraordinary move in our lives and we don't have to wait till we see it we see it in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus we claim our victory and we seal it with the evidence of our confidence that you are capable and competent to perform every promise and that is our praise on the level of your expectation on the level of your expectation oh y'all still playing with it on the level if you don't expect much don't praise much but I'm gonna show him I believe he's God I believe he's able I believe he's mighty I believe he's capable I believe he's faithful I believe he's merciful I believe he's gracious I believe he's all-powerful I believe he's sovereign 